Grace Church, it's wonderful to see you. Let's stand and sing this morning. Is anybody feeling that extra hour, like kind of missing out of our lives? <laughs> well, let's sing together. Come on. Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. every day that Jesus is indeed alive. Amen? And Easter is coming. It kicks off with Good Friday services right here, 6 p.m. and 7.30. Good Friday, the Friday before Easter Sunday, out in Chaska as well as Southwest Christian High School, 6 and 7.30 p.m. Good Friday service. 
And then Easter Sunday kicks off here, 8 a.m. It's the early service, 8 a.m. here, and then 9.30 and 11.15 here, and Chaska as well. Go online for more information, grace.church slash Easter. Who are you gonna bring? Not just invite, hey, you should come with me. No, bring them, show up at their house and wait for them to come out. I'm out here waiting, let's go to church together. Bring them, pray about those people that you want to bring, and then make sure to register your attendance, okay? We don't need a QR code, you don't need a ticket. We're past that, thank the Lord. But we do need to know if you're coming, all right? So we have to manage the space in here. So uh, in particular for your kids, let us know if your kids are coming, because we've got nurseries that are gonna be opening up and so forth, which is a really good thing, but we need your help. We need 63 volunteers for Good Friday service. 63 out of this whole congregation. Would someone step forward today and say, yep, put me in, I'll help for Good Friday service, kids ministry, and then Easter Sunday, 105 spots left to fill to cover all of those services. 105, go to grace.church slash Easter volunteer to serve in children's ministry, and then don't forget to register your own attendance, all right? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Glad you're here. Let's continue in worship.
good. You know, uh, I realized this week that this is the week, this is the year anniversary of when the whole world shut down. Remember that? So this team, this, this, this church, uh, we were trying to figure out a way to do church and we, you know, can we still have church? What's going on with all this stuff? And everything had to shut down. And so there was still worship, there was still uh, a sermon, but it was all online. It was the first time there weren't people in the room. And from there, came really just a confusing and difficult year for all of us in so many ways, like unprecedented. Lots of stuff to worry about, lots of stuff to navigate, a lot of things to figure out. But in the midst of it all, God was still faithful. Amen? And he is faithful and he will be faithful forever. He is good. No matter what our circumstances look like, you know, there's job loss, there's, there's sickness, there's all kinds of things that we've had to face just in this year. But he is faithful. So I want to read Psalm 46, and then we're going to sing this. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle, or else we battle, oh, 
Savior at hand this morning for all that he's done for us. God is faithful, not just this year, but our whole lives. And he gave us Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Let's dig into the word this morning. Good to see you guys. Thanks for being here today. I want to welcome you to Grace. Welcome everyone in the chapel. Chaska, certainly a huge hello to uh, everyone watching online today. We are in a, a teaching series walking through the New Testament book of 1 Peter. We're in chapter 5. Hallelujah, right? There are only five chapters. We're almost there. We're almost home. So if you would make your way to 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll pick up today in verse 1. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are... There are 13 elders that provide direction and oversight, right, to, to the ministry here of, of Grace Church. And, and elders here at Grace, now here's their picture. Dan Mayusi is our current chairman. Dave Carlson has been a chairman. Dave Heine, great godly brothers here that serve the Lord, right, and try to oversee, right, by the grace of God, where God is calling us and what God is calling us to be as a church family. And so elders here at Grace set direction, kind of where we're going. Uh, they ensure correct doctrine, right, to make sure the teaching's clean and straight from the word. They, they, they exist to help deploy people in the ministry. So the, the role of an elder is to get people to serve and to be engaged. And then finally, elders are in charge of like practicing church, church discipline, right? We want the church to be pure and to have a, a, a clean witness in the community. And these elders are, I would say, called by God and then confirmed and ratified by you, the body of Jesus Christ. And just so you know, Grace is going to, to need lots of additional elders in the years ahead. So, so this really needs to be on your radar. And the truth is this, like leadership is essential always, right? Leadership is essential at home. It's essential at work, right? And it is certainly foundational and essential in the church. And especially so during times of like 
pain and heartache and, and suffering. Leadership is always important during those moments of crisis, right? And so it's no surprise then that, that Peter talks about both godly leadership qualities in elders as he addresses his community, right? in the first century, but he also talks about the need for a godly receptivity towards leadership in our text for the day. And I would say this, like Peter of all people knows good leadership and bad leadership, right? Like he knows the most amazing leader who's ever lived, that being the person of Jesus Christ, right? So he walked alongside Jesus, right, for at least three years, maybe longer. We also know that he walked alongside Judas, right? So you get to see an amazing glimpse of leadership and then a not so amazing picture of leadership. And so he addresses that for us today. First Peter 5, if you'd stand with me in honor of God's word, we'll read verses 1 to 7. Peter writes, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those under your charge or in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, literally means younger men. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Would you say that out loud with me? God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Amen? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In, in, verses, in verses 1 and 2, Peter uses the word elder, bishop, shepherd, shepherd slash pastor, to speak of the unique roles of, of an elder. The word elder describes maturity. Uh, the, the word bishop describes responsibility, like overseer. And the word pastor slash shepherd describes ministry. A ministry of feeding and caring for people, right? Feeding people the word of God. Now, I, I love the fact that Peter doesn't come off like a diva here, right? As one of the few original surviving followers of Jesus Christ still living, many, many pastors and leaders in his day like revered him, pedal, pedestalized him. But Peter simply says, right, look, I, I'm an elder. I'm, I'm one of you. He's really grounded in his identity. And then notice what he says next. I, I was there. He's like, I had a front row seat to, to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was there when he suffered, right? I was a witness to the cross. I was a, a witness to the resurrection. He, he, he then tells us, right, that he's waiting for Christ to return to and you read this, and you're like, well, what, what's he really saying here? Well, it's actually super instructive for us in that the first mark of a, of a good elder is a man who's had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. So you cannot lead in the church, you cannot lead the church without a deep and abiding and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And I, I always say it like this. A growing relationship with Jesus Christ is more important than having an MBA. It's more important than an Ivy League education. It's more important than having a ton of experience in the business world or personal financial success. Knowing Jesus, growing in his word is everything. It is the hallmark of eldership. And so elders and leaders need to be deeply connected to Jesus. They need to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? The cross and resurrection should actually mean something to them. Secondly, Peter says that elders and leaders need, need to care deeply for people. They so need to love God deeply, love Christ deeply, but they also need to care deeply for, for people. So, so elders oversee, right? Elders protect, right? They look out for people. 
So, so the role of an elder is to kind of get at the balcony level and oversee, right, and protect what is going on in the church. Look at verse 2 and 3. He says, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So, so elders don't serve begrudgingly. They do it eagerly. They, they do it because they want to, not because they have to. They do it willingly. And so, and so a pastor or an elder should never say, man, I hate being at the church. I hate being with God's people. They're such a drag. They're such a drain. Right? That would be a sign that that person doesn't have the gifting or the calling of, of being a leader and an elder. Absolutely not, right? Because elders serve, right? They lead. They exercise oversight because they care for people, right? They care so deeply for people, they want people to know and to love and to follow Jesus Christ. As well, Peter says, elders aren't in it to get rich. It's what that phrase, not for shameful gain, means, right? In verse 2. So elders aren't trying to make a buck from the church. They're not users of God's people to line their pockets in order to get wealthy, right? They're here to serve the church. And just an FYI, I'll ask you this question. How much do you think the elders at Grace Church make per year? Like what would be their annual salary they would make here? I would say that nada, zero, zilcho. And so we give them a pay raise every single year. You started with zero, we're gonna, we're gonna up that again, you get zero again. They're not in it to make money, right? They're in it because they, they care for you, right? They care for the word, they care for the gospel, right? They love the church, they wanna bless the church, nourish the church, shepherd the church, right? So they're not in it for, for what they get out of it. Now, sadly, in Peter's day, we know that wasn't true, right? There were lots of false teachers and elders who tried to fleece the church, right, for cash, right? They didn't serve because they cared for people, right? They served because they cared about money. Then, then, then Peter says, right, that elders are, I would summarize this like this, elders are essentially overseers, not overlords, right? Overseers, not overlords, like not domineering. Like, like elders aren't there to dominate and to be authoritarian. No, they're, they're servants, right? Elders are, are, aren't leaders of servants. They're servant leaders. And, and here's what he says. I, I like this language. He says they are examples to the flock, meaning they, they should live out the Christian life in a really winsome and compelling way. There should be a genuineness in their Christianity that you can look at their lives, you can look at their marriages, right? You can look at how they raise their children. You can look at what they do with their finances and go, yeah, there's something to learn and there's something to, to gain or glean from looking at how they do their Christian life. And so to summarize, listen, elders have a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They have a persuasive right, winsome Christian life, and then they have a powerful desire to please Christ. So, so elders serve, they fulfill their calling so that, look in verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So, so there is one chief shepherd. I'm not the chief shepherd of this church. The elders aren't the chief shepherds of this church. We're like sheepdogs, right? We're just sheepdogs trying to protect people, right? But there is one chief shepherd whose name is Jesus Christ. And, and here's the thing, right? When we do ministry, we do ministry because we want to please one person. And his name is Jesus Christ. So I would say this. If your goal in ministry is to please people, you'll be like a dog chasing its tail. There will be lots of activity, no productivity, right? There'll be lots of movement, right? Lots of activity, but nothing substantial happening. And, and here's the thing, like if your whole goal in life or ministry is just to please people, listen, you'll never be able to accomplish it, right? It'll never happen because as soon as you please someone, guess what happens? You displease someone else. Like I can't even please all five members of my family, right? You can't even pull that one off, right? Let alone in the church full of a thousand plus people, right? And so the goal then is to please the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's what I say, we all serve at the pleasure of Jesus. Like we, we all serve at the pleasure of Jesus and for the purpose of pleasing 
Jesus Christ. And so bottom line, the church needs good, godly, called, Jesus-loving, people-loving, gospel-centered, right, gospel-focused elders. And here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. We have them here by the grace of God at Grace Church. We, we really, we really do. But the church also needs something else. Not only does it need good leaders, it needs, it needs people willing to, to be led. Now, now, from my experience, right, when, when churches like go through times of transition or seasons of difficulty, there arises all kinds of challenges to, to leadership. And oftentimes, according to Peter, it's the younger men who lead the uprising. It's essentially what he says in verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Essentially, he's like to all the younger dudes, like, listen, like fall in line here. Be subject to the elders, right? Don't snub your nose at authority in your life. Right, fall in, in, in line here. Now you might ask, like, why would Peter single out young men in verse five? To which I would say, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I was young once, so I do have some thoughts. It might be, it might be because, because young men can be more impulsive, uh, more aggressive, more headstrong, more opinionated than, than other people in the church. And, and I can only speak from personal experience here. When, when I was growing up, I remember challenging everything my father said, everything my coaches said, everything my teachers said. I always felt like I was the smartest one in the room or had all the answers right. I was a bit of a in the Greek, we would call it knucklehead, right? I was a bit of a knucklehead, right? And so I would say this, just to be clear, like being young is, is amazing. It's amazing in a, in a lot of ways, but it can, also, it can also be a dangerous time because younger people can think that they're smarter than everybody else, especially the older generation. And that seems to be what Peter is, is hitting at here. And he's essentially saying this can be catastrophic, right, to a church. And so Peter's like, listen, hey, young guys, like young men, listen up. He's like, listen, you guys, listen, be subject to the elders. And you remember he used that phrase, be subject, like seven times already, right? Have you noticed that? In chapters three and four, it's like, be subject, husbands and wives, right? He talks about it in the status of employee to employer. So he, he said, be subject, be subject, be subject. So there's a larger principle, I think, that surfaces here, and it is this. I think he wants us to remember that submission is necessary to keeping things running smoothly at home and at work and certainly in the church, right? Like submission, think of submission like a lubricant, like oil to the grinding that happens in an engine, right? That oil keeps everything lubricate, lubricated, everything running smoothly. Without submission, things come to a grinding, screeching halt. And then finally he says to all of you, so notice what he does. He addresses elders, elders, then he addresses younger men, and then he has a broad message to all of you. Look what he says, verse 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. Right? For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So, so, so one translation says, put the, put the overalls of, of humility on. Must be the redneck version of the Bible. I didn't know there was a redneck version. There must be a redneck version of the Bible. Put the overalls of humility on, right? Now, now here's the thing about humility. Humility is a tricky kind of a value and virtue, right? It, it's, really, it's really hard to, to wrap your arms around. And I say it's tricky because it's a virtue that if you think you have it, it shows that you don't, right? Like, like as soon as you think, okay, I'm humble, you've just blown your case, right, for, for being humble. It's one of those slippery kinds of, uh, of virtues. Uh, Dwight Moody used to pray, Lord, make me humble, but don't let me know it, right? So that'd be, that's a good prayer, right? Like, make me humble, just don't let me know it. Because I may fall prey to that. It's like the pastor who said, 
He said, listen, I got a, I got a great sermon on humility, but I'm going to wait till I get a much bigger crowd before I can preach it. I'll let you do the math on that, right? That's, that's kind of what's inside of us, right? Or it's like the church who wanted to find the most humble person in their congregation. And so they formed a humility search committee. And then names were submitted and they voted on, on the winner, the most humble person in the church. And it happened to be a little old guy who was always behind the scenes, never got any accolades, any recognition, never took credit for anything. He was voted the most humble person in the church, and the church gave him a little pin, most humble. Sadly, they had to take it away the next week because he wore it to church. That's kind of what this humility thing is, right? As soon as you think, I got it, you're like, I don't have it. That's why I like Moody's prayer. Lord, make me humble, don't let me know it, because then you get proud of your humility, right? And so it's a hard one, it's a hard one to em embrace, right? But notice what Peter does. Peter pushes all of us towards humility, and he tells us why in verse 5. He tells us theologically about something about God. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, I want you just to chew on that for a minute. God opposes the proud. The quickest way to pick a fight with God is to be prideful. It's to be proud. If you want resistance from God, listen. If you want resistance from God, be proud. God hates pride. And so when you're proud, it's like chasing God off. God is like, no, to people who are proud. It sets you against him and him against you. But notice what Peter says. God actually gives grace to the humble. So how many of you are like, I want more grace in my life? I can tell you how to get more grace in your life. Be humble, right? So when you're humble, humility is like a lightning rod that attracts more of God's grace into your life. Then look at what Peter says. He says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, he, God, may exalt you. And so the Old Testament used this phrase, under the mighty hand of God, again and again and again to talk about God's power in delivering people who are in trouble. And you're like, well, how does, this, like, how does this all connect? Like, connect the dots for me here. Well, here's why I think Peter is using it in this instance. I, I think it's simply a, a reminder that when you submit to another human being, whether it be wives to husbands, employees to employers, right, younger people, right, church people to elders, all of that, when you submit to a human being, it's scary, and here's why it's scary. They may not lead well, right? They might take advantage of you. But here's Peter's point. He's essentially saying as a believer, you're actually able to submit because you are aware of God's sovereignty, right? When, when you submit, you're resting in God's ability, right? You're resting in his lordship more than man's leadership, you're acknowledging his lordship in your act of, of submission. And so here's the illustration. In the same way that you go to a hospital for surgery, you've heard the phrase, you go under the knife. So you're essentially submitting yourself to the capable hands of a physician in hopes that in due time, well, you'll be raised back up. That's the exact idea here. God loves the attitude of surrender and submission and humility and compliance, not because he wants to hold you down, but because he wants to lift you up. Do you see that? So a lot of people, humility, no, no, no. Submission, no, 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 no. And when you think that way, when you believe in that way, all you're doing is you're missing what God wants to do in your life because God loves to exalt people in his own way. So what does he say? He says at the proper time, he will exalt you. He will lift you up. So the goal in humility is not just to keep you down. The goal in humility 
is that you would humble yourself before God so God can do this deep work in you and promote you at the right time, right? Position you in the right way, exalt you in the proper fashion. Then Peter ends by saying, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares from and cares for you. So, so let me tell you how this, this fits. He's talking, right? He's giving us this idea here of how important humility is. And, and here's his point. Proud people don't pray. There's one thing proud people don't do. Proud people don't pray. Right? Proud people are self-reliant, right? They're independent. Like proud people, don't, they don't ask God for help. But here's what humble people do. Humble people pray. Humble people ask for other people to pray for them. And so here's what Peter says. Here's one of the ways you engage whether you have humility in your heart. Do you cast all your cares upon him? It literally means to throw all the weight of your anxiety on him. Throw all the weight of your anxiety, all your cares, throw it upon him. So sometimes when uh, Sherry's out and about kind of doing her thing, she'll go to the grocery and, and she'll come home and She's got groceries all packed into the car, and she'll text me and go, hey, uh, hey, I'm out in the garage. Can you help me carry these groceries in? And I hate making like four, five, six trips, right? I hate that, especially when it's like 12 below zero. You're like out in the garage, you're in your socks, and it's freezing. And so I like to do it all in one trip. And so I get the bags, I try to slide the bags up my arm, and literally like, I'll get as many bags as I possibly can, you know. I have a bag here, bag here, bag here, and I try to then squeeze stuff into my chest, and I'm carrying all these bags. And, and usually by the time I get from the garage into the kitchen, I've laden myself down with such weight that I've literally got to lunge these bags like towards the kitchen counter, right? And just pray that nothing gets smashed along the way. So literally it's like you're a carryman and you just like throw them up on the counter and oh, there's a relief. That's the picture that goes through my mind with this verse. So think of it this way. When stress, when worry, anxiety comes your way, you have one of two choices. You can either carry the worry or you can cast the worry. I mean, those are your choices. Either you, you carry it or you do what? You, you cast it upon him. And here's why, listen, if you're wondering like, well, why should I cast my anxieties and my cares and my worries upon him? Look at the last four words of verse seven. Look what he says. He cares for you. That's why you should do it. He cares for you. And for some of you, 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 you may never have thought of God in that way. That God actually cares. Because some people have this idea, you know, God is so super busy and he's dealing with stuff in the Middle East that he, like he, like he's got so much on his plate that I really don't need to bring this to God. I don't need to think about this. I'll just deal with it myself. And people are like, no, cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And I read that this week. I thought, wow, to have somebody, God, to actually care for me is an amazing thought to consider, isn't it? And some of you need to hear that today, that God loves you. Not only does he love you, he cares for you. Like he legitimately cares for you. He cares for you by giving you good leaders. He cares for you by, by giving you his word for help. He cares by sending you a savior, right? He cares by taking your anxieties upon himself. And he cares for you by caring for you. God is a caring God. That's what Peter tells us. Now let me give you, let me give you six final thoughts from, from 1 Peter. I know that felt like in the first hour when I did that, it kind of feels like you're in a plane and it feels like you touched down and then you took back off. I know that felt like that, didn't it? Like because the tone and the pace felt like it was over. Did you all, did you all think it was over? Because I could see in your face it's kind of like, Oh, we touched down, we're going back up. So let me give you six, <laughs> let me give you six final thoughts. Six final thoughts from 1 Peter 5, 1 to 7. Because I felt like when I, was, when I was trying to piece this all together, I'm like, yeah, I think I'm clear, but I'm not clear enough. And so this is, this is not another sermon. 
So it's not gonna be long, even though I'm prolonging it now and trying to help you understand <laughs> that it's not gonna be long, but I can just see the disappointment in your faces. You should have seen your face, you're like. <laughs> and a lot of you are really down, you're like, dude, like I lost an hour <laughs> and I came here today, you know, and, and now you tell them you got six, six more things to say. <laughs> Just six more, six more. So, so, so this has nothing to do with the sermon. So, so when I was, uh, when I was uh, taking preaching, when I was taking preaching, and this is like taking eight minutes to do this part right here. So when I was taking preaching, this old timer, he goes, uh, he goes like this. He goes, right before the sermon, he goes, you know what it means when a Baptist pastor takes his watch off? Nothing. That's what it means. Absolutely nothing. I'll never forget that. Like, it's true, man. We never even look at it. So six final thoughts from 1 Peter 5, 1 to 7, okay? Now, quickly, quick. You listen quick. I'll talk fast. You listen fast. Okay, ready? Here we go. Number one. Realize, realize the elders of Grace Church need your support. They really do. And here's what I would say. Like, I know these guys personally. They are godly guys. They're legit. They're authentic. They love Jesus. They love you. Their hearts are right. They're, they're in it for all the right reasons. And they need your support. They need your prayer support, right? I'd also say this, like, uh, pray for the future elders of, of Grace Church that God would bring us the right people, Right? So that they would feel called, and then you, the body of Christ, you would ratify it, right, when we vote people in coming in June. Uh, number two, I would say this. Realize if, if you won't honor someone older than you, the Lord won't honor you. There's, there, there's, there, there's, there's, something, there's something in this honor thing for us, this honor code in the Bible. And, and I don't think we're very good in the honor department these days. And so I think we've got to be good at honoring those people who have gone before us. We have to be good at honoring those people who are older than us. We want, we want to honor, 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 right? Because that honors God when we honor other people. Uh, number three, I would say this. Realize that God does not help those who help themselves. He helps those who humble themselves. So this whole idea that God helps those who help themselves, No. That's nowhere in the scriptures. But God does help those who humble themselves. I will say this. God is personally and providentially supportive of the humble. He is. Number four, realize that reflecting on the cross is the key to humility. So John Stott had this insight. I'm going to read this quote. It's an amazing quote. I'll put it on the screen. Stott said this. Every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to be saying to us, I'm here because of you. It's your sin I'm bearing, your curse I'm suffering, your debt I'm paying, your death I'm dying. Nothing in, in the history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, especially in self-righteousness, until we have visited a place called Calvary. It is there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to true Size. Isn't that a great thought, right? So if you struggle with humility, come to the cross for inspiration. And the, remember, the purpose in humility isn't just like to keep you down. When you humble yourself, God wants to do what? He wants to exalt you. He wants to promote you. He wants to raise you up. So you're submitting to God's plan for your life. Number five, realize the need to declare war on pride in your life. God hates the sin of pride. It is, it is, listen to this, pride is the core sin of every sin. It is the core sin of every single sin. And so we've got to die towards this tendency that we all have in us towards self-sufficiency and this desire to live independently of God. And, and I think prayer is like how we communicate our neediness. One of the things that Pastor Rob Reno said last week, and I thought, oh, that's it, that's great, it's a great insight. He said, when we're talking about prayer, stop looking at prayer like it's a discipline. Stop looking at it like it's a discipline and look at it like you're a needy person who needs God. And I thought, that's exactly right. Like, like when we pray, all we're saying is we're really needy people. 
So don't, don't like take prayer and go, okay, somehow now I'm more spiritual as we use it as some kind of a discipline to show our godliness. No, prayer communicates dependency. It communicates neediness of God. And, and then number six, I would say this, realize today that God really does care for you. Some of you haven't felt loved, you haven't felt cared for, valued by anyone. And I'm here to tell you the most important being ever, God himself loves you and cares for you. Like he cares for you. He cares about your family. He cares about your health. He cares about your mental health. He cares, cares about your job. He cares about your kids. He cares about your marriage, right? He cares about your future. And, and thank God he cares about your salvation. So much so that he willingly gave you his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sins in our place so that you and I could have this divine exchange. So by faith I say yes to Jesus and his righteousness gets credited to me so that when God looks at me, he no longer sees me, he sees that I have been clothed and robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and he sees me now is in right standing with God because I've trusted in Jesus. The cross is a sign of how much God cares for you. Amen? Amen. He cares. And so listen, cast all of your cares upon him. All of them. Cast all your anxieties on him. Because he's the God who cares for you. Amen? That wasn't too bad. It was only six. Sure. Okay. Let's pray. It's only 1030 on my watch, by the way. So someone needs to fix my watch here. Someone smart. Help me fix my watch here at the end. God, thank you so much for your word and for how relevant and timely it is. Help us today to understand how much you do care for us. Help us all to declare war on pride in our lives. Help us, Lord, today to, to come to the cross to understand what genuine humility is. Lord, help us today to to pray for the elders of grace and for future elders of grace. And Lord, help us to honor those who are older than us today. And Lord, help us to realize today that you don't help those who help themselves, you help those who humble themselves. And so we wanna humble ourselves before you today in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together in response this morning. And we sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, so Jesus the name Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say yeah. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh we live for you
continue in worship this morning with giving. If you've come today prepared to give in an offering, you'll see giving stations at all of the entrances and exits here at Grace. If you're watching online, you can give in the Grace Church app, and you can also give online at grace.church slash give. Your giving, your faithful obedience and generosity allows us to continue to share the gospel across the street and around the world and to continue to develop resources to know how to how to share it how to engage in conversation with people including discovery bible studies check it out i'm a runner and during the pandemic when the the gyms were closed that's all i did and that's the best time for me to really commune with christ and just speak to him and have him speak to me so those people that I would see kind of running through my head as I ran would keep me up at night. They would be hurting with, you know, various things from the pandemic, um, divorce, or they were putting faith in man. And I just thought, I don't care what people think anymore. I, I would rather have them have that gift of ultimate love that Christ gave us and be in heaven than to go to hell someday. I don't want that for my friends and family. One of my friends actually contacted me by phone that very evening and she said, I want to learn. I want to know who Jesus is. And she goes, I listened to your video three times. I want what you have. And I said, let's, let's get together then. And we're going through the book of John and she's learning. And I am just, 
on cloud nine because I love teaching people and having them know about Jesus, I went through a process called Discovery Bible Study. So you can pick a book of the Bible, but John is a really good one to start with because it's it's a gospel and it's, it's pretty clear and straightforward on Jesus's life. So we have a format, it's super easy to follow. It's excellent to prepare with. It gives you questions, guiding questions, so you don't have to feel like the expert. So that's what we started. That's a Discovery Bible Study, and it's the best thing you can ever do. Cheryl is so much like me. She's like you. It's like, I love Jesus. I want to be able to share my faith. I just really don't know how to engage in a conversation and talk about the Bible, right? Discovery Bible Studies will help you do that. So go online, grace.church slash DBS, Discovery Bible Study, and get some more information, all right? Or even better yet, Sarah, maybe we could just bring the house lights up. And on the back of your seats, I think it's every other seat here in the auditorium, and you're going to get it, get it online as well. I think there's a QR code. We've had these QR codes around at the entrances and exits, right, as you leave. We put them on the back of the seats. So everything we've talked about today, including Discovery Bible Study, all the information that you need to get, just scan the code. If you want to connect at Grace, if you want to give, you want to find out what the latest thing happening at Grace is, just every Sunday, sit down, scan it and that little digital bulletin will come up right in front of you. And it's a great way for you to access a lot of things here at Grace. So take advantage of that in the weeks coming, all right? Um, we're glad that you're here. We don't take it for granted ever. I, I just continue to meet, we continue to meet as a staff, so many new people coming every Sunday. I see them out at Guest Central. We see them coming into Bible studies throughout the week. And we don't take it lightly that you're here. If you need some more information about Grace Church, go to grace.church slash connect or scan that code right in front of you or come out and see us at Guest Central. Let's all stand together. If you need prayer today, we'd love to pray for you. Come on down to the front. Um, if you're watching online, go to grace.church slash prayer. You can also here in the auditorium, scan that code and send your prayer request and we would love to be able to pray for you. Um, and by the way, as you leave today, the cafe is open now. Another sign of normalcy. Go get a donut, get some coffee. You just can't fellowship. So close. Seriously, cafe's open, and I told him I'm going to tell him, so get ready and go and just overwhelm him, all right? It'll be awesome. Let's pray. I had a donut in my pocket. Yes, I did. And I have 400 sprinkles in that pocket right now. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the privilege to come together today. We don't take it for granted. Thank you for your powerful, sweet presence with us today. Help us to walk with you as we leave this place. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Everybody said... Amen. See you later.